Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So every so often I get asked about doing a stream on how I come up with an optimized build. Now, there are a number of reasons that is not ideal for me. First off, I usually do my brainstorming without my lights on. Maybe I've shaved, maybe I haven't. Maybe I'm brainstorming while I'm trying to get to sleep, which is a terrible combination by the way. But you go to bed, then you start thinking about this build you're developing and how it might work, and you don't fall asleep. But that's another issue. I often don't come up with all the ideas for my build in one sitting. And sometimes I'm not productive at all. I'll sit down, get up, and nothing has been accomplished. I probably have as many times where I've sat down to think of build ideas, then abandon the exercise because I'm just not coming up with anything. And that's happened as many times as I've been successful. And I think that would make for an incredibly boring stream. Also, scheduling creativity. I mean, I know there are some people who can do it, but I am not one of them. I can pretty much give this as a guarantee. If I was in full lighting, camera on, interacting with viewers live, and trying to come up with ideas, that's just not going to work out. My best ideas come when I'm alone, with minimal distractions, and absolutely zero multitasking. However, I figure that maybe what I can do is a video where I discuss the process I use, I mean, I don't know how well it'll apply to you, and I don't know how closely it lines up with other optimizers who make character builds. Maybe I should talk about this with Colby from D4 Deep Dive at some point and see if our methods are similar or not. But then, after I go over the process, what I want to do is give you an actual example, as in the example of the build that I'm doing next. This video is made possible by the patrons of this channel. If you'd be interested in supporting content like this, please consider joining my Patreon. The link is in the video description. Today I'm thanking my top level patrons. Airhead, Alex R, Vo, Bloody9, Atherazone, Chris C, Clement Brunette, Coral, Dank Train, Dewey Cheetahman Howe, Douglas Reynolds, Eden the DM, Eric Wasserman, FBK05, Gishlife, Lightfoot, Hendry, Heisenberger, Jay Gemmel, James Makla, James Sprague, Jean Baptiste Blanchett. Jeriru, John Matera, Jonathan Zucker, Joseph Van Horn, Justin Times, Lars V, Mark D, Mark Sexton, Math Guy Dave, Mr. Brett, PCZ, Pedro Tabaka, Raman Goblin, Scott Parsons, Sig, Tazel, Thunderlock, Vu, and William Whittles. And an additional thank you to all the patrons of this channel. Let's get started. So if I'm making a character for an upcoming campaign, something I'm going to personally play, I usually come up with my concept first, like who do I want them to be, what do I want the personality to be like, what are they going to look like, what kind of flavor I want their abilities to have, and kind of what I want them to be able to do. Then I start hunting for the mechanics that bring that concept to life. And I have a fair bit of experience with the various mechanics and how they work, if they're any good. So I can draw upon that existing knowledge and just kind of fill in the blanks. And you know what? The character is going to be reasonably optimized. But the mechanics the character uses aren't generally going to be a new idea. I'm drawing from ideas that I've dealt with before. But if I want to make a build for this channel, then it's different. Because presenting a build that does the same thing as another build I've presented, but packaged up with a different concept, it isn't generally my brand. What I want is for you, my viewer, to walk away with an idea of a new mechanical interaction that you haven't seen before. And you can draw upon that interaction if you're making your own character. Same for me. Now I have one more tool I can draw from when making characters for my personal use, even if the concept is totally different than the one I presented in the build video. Now sometimes an optimized build is simply how to make a good Gloomstalker Ranger, a good wizard, and then the build's pretty easy because it's just a presentation of established wisdom. Get the shield spell. Get crossbow expert. Get advantage on attacks. Get the spells we know are good spells. Protect your concentration. There's nothing wrong with these kinds of builds, and I've done these kinds of builds on my channel. But I'll be honest, these kinds of builds are largely filler content. I don't need to come up with anything new or novel. It's simply a case of presenting established knowledge. And you know what? If I sit down trying to come up with an optimized build with a new idea, and I fail to come up with a new idea, then 
that's probably the kind of build video I'm going to make. So, I want to make a grappling build. Okay, uh, it's a rune knight. Athletics expertise. Here's how you handle making sure you have a hand free to grapple. Here's what you're going to be doing after you grapple. For a viewer that already has that knowledge, they likely aren't actually learning anything new from that video. But you know what, they still might get value from confirming stuff they were already aware of, or maybe they have a piece of knowledge I didn't have so they can comment on that opportunity that I missed in the comment section. I know a lot of my viewers love to go through my videos very carefully looking for any little error so they can tell me in the comments. And these kinds of builds and videos, for me, they're easy because I don't need to come up with any new ideas for them. So if I'm stuck, then I'll give you an optimized but vanilla take on a build for this subclass or whatever. The builds I tend to be more proud of are when they present a new idea or an interaction that I came up with for that build. Now, when it's really easy is when there's new content out because I'll read through new content and often I'll see mechanics there and it's no work at all. I'll see a mechanic and I immediately know what that would interact with from existing mechanics. And I think, okay, so this new thing would work really well with this old thing. And then I start thinking of builds right away. That is when it's absolutely easiest. When it's hard is times like now where there's not really a lot of new content or mechanics to work around. So now I just have existing mechanics. And we already know a lot of the combinations from those mechanics. So now I've got to come up with something that is new, but also from old material. So what I'll periodically do is I'll brainstorm to come up with that new idea. I generally start with a mechanic first. I recently did a whole series on Wild Shape because it's a mechanic I had never done a deep dive on before or any builds based around Wild Shape. And I thought, you know, I haven't really seen a lot of other people do builds based around Wild Shape either. There's like novelty builds. There's the Barbarian or the Barbarian, I'm told it's called now. Uh, and that's a novelty build where you're going to take the Bear and Barbarian and you get something special out of it. But when I looked at the build and did some analysis, I determined, yeah, it's great at level four. It's not so great at higher levels and it just gets worse and worse. So that's not a build I would ever present partially because it's not my build, but also partially because if it was my build, it wouldn't be good enough because it only works at low levels. And so I did analysis of that, determined it doesn't work at higher levels. So I did a video about that and why the barbarian is okay at those low levels, but not good at high levels. And that was a teaser that I'm going to be looking at Moon Druid at higher levels. The other build I've seen sometimes for Moon Druid is where you are playing a Druid who is going to wild shape into a mount, and then some other member of your party takes the mounted combatant feat, and then you would normally take the sentinel feat, and then you get an interaction with that where an enemy tries to target you, but because mounted combatant, you can force them to target the other person. That sets off your reaction attack from sentinels, so you can get an extra attack, and you know, that's, again, kind of a novelty build, and it also doesn't hold up at higher levels. Uh, so that wasn't going to be a build that I was going to really look at either. What I wanted to do is figure, is there some form of build that I can come up with for Moon Druid that works at higher levels? Because, you know, you look at CR1 forms, and there's lots of good forms, and you're at a level when they're really good. And then you get to your CR2 forms, and it is trailing off. The most interesting one there, I figure, is the giant constrictor snake because you can have that restrain effect, but it's not something you can really optimize around. And then I got to the CR3 forms, and the best form there is probably the uh, giant scorpion, which isn't a very good form. Uh, and, you know, the moon druid is really trailing off. And conventional wisdom is, at higher levels, you don't want to be a moon druid. You want to be some other subclass of druid because their features are scaling better. But at level 10, you do get Elemental Wild Shape, which is a significant power increase. And if you look at the Elementals, they have lots of interesting features. And I thought, if there's something interesting and new to say about Wild Shape, it's got to be here. We know that Elementals are pretty good. And so I could do a couple vanilla builds. I could say, okay, here's an Earth Elemental. You can transform into this, and then you punch somebody, and then you sink beneath the ground, and they can't attack you back. You know, I could do something like that, but I'm not presenting anything new. I could come up with that build in 10 minutes. 
Uh, and I might, like that's filler content, but sometimes it ends up being filler content because I look at those and I just can't come up with anything. But it's not something I do in a few minutes. What I'll do is I'll take those elemental forms, I'll study them, and then I will start going through. Okay, I'm gonna go through the feats, one at a time. Is there any feat here that I see that would have some kind of special interaction with elemental wild shape? How about spells? How about racial features? And most of it is just reading. Like, could you imagine how boring that stream would be? Is, okay, I'm gonna stream me optimizing a build, I'm looking at wild shape, and then it's me reading for two hours, and then going, yeah, there's nothing here. That would be most of my streams, because that's usually what happens. And when I did those uh, videos for wild shape spells and wild shape feats, I said in all of them, I'm going to be presenting builds at the end of this, because that was the guarantee. What wasn't guaranteed is that those builds were gonna present anything that was particularly new. They might just be, the, this is how you play a Moon Druid. However, I was hoping I would come up with some interactions that were novel. Now, one interaction I had seen before is I have played in a game where another player used Elemental Wild Shape and they had Multi-Class Paladin and they used Smite with it. Uh, that's all I know about that build. I don't know what levels were taken. I don't remember what race it was. It was one session in a one shot, but I do remember I thought it worked together reasonably well. And the other thing I remember is that I had never seen that combination before or heard about that combination before. And I was curious, like, did they just get lucky or is there actually something there? So I knew that that was one thing I was going to look at was combining Smite and Elemental Wild Shape. And so I did some preliminary math on it. And I have to say, I wasn't a huge fan because I'm looking and I'm like, you know, we have a fair amount of Smites, but considering what they're adding and that you are using a resource, there's just not quite enough here. And I'm like, I what I need is to crit fish. And I don't like crit fishing. Uh, it's generally not something I try to do on builds, but I knew that here it kind of needed to do some crit fishing. So then I'm like, okay, I need to increase my critical range. So I'll take either champion or hexblade. Hexblade would be easier because it's just one level dip. Then I need to come up with a way to get advantage. And getting advantage, not quite as easy. And then I'm like, you know, one way I could get advantage is the Guardian of Nature spell. And then I thought, you know, I didn't talk about the Guardian of Nature spell in my spells video or my spells for Wild Shape video. But it's the right fit here because it's what I need to do. And it's one of those cases where I came up with a consideration while working on the build that I hadn't when I actually went through spells. So then you see a spell that I kind of concentrate on the build that I never talked about in my spells video. So if you notice that, you know, I took spells that I didn't talk about in my spells video, I know. That's the reason it worked out that way. Now that build took a little bit of work, but I gotta say that it didn't take any work compared to the Fire Elemental build, because that one took a ton of time to come up with. And it was basically a case of, I was going through the Elementals and I was looking at their features and trying to figure out, you know, what can I kind of work around? And I noticed that the Fire Elemental has all this secondary burn damage. And I'm like, there's gotta be a way that I can apply that more often so that I can build that up in damage. And then I thought it could be combined with something like Fire Shield, uh, maybe Armor of Agathis, though that didn't end up on the build. But then I thought, how am I going to get it so that creatures will attack me while they're within five feet of me? Because a lot of creatures have reach. And then that's when I came up with the idea of grappling. And then I thought, the problem with grappling with the Fire Elemental is it has a strength of 10. And uh, I thought of a lot of ways that I might deal with that. Um, one of the ways that I really deep dived into that I thought I was going to do and ended up not doing was I was considering Astral Self Monk because Astral Self Monk can get those arms and then they can grapple using their wisdom. I thought that was a possibility. But I tell you, I went down that road and I looked at all the mechanics and I played with builds and it just, it was too many levels and it just wasn't working out. So I ended up abandoning that and coming up with other ways that I figured that at least I can probably grapple even with my strength of 10. And then once I did that, and then I figured out the ways to get the most damage out of that, then I had a build to present that I had never seen before, I had never heard anyone talk about before, 
it was my idea and I figured if I present that in a video, now my viewers can watch that and now they have an idea that maybe they've never thought of before. And the next time they're considering playing a Moon Druid at higher levels, they know there's this one interaction that they can maybe try out. But when I do brainstorming, it doesn't always end up being productive. Uh, so I did a series of videos where I did Warlock builds and I did a Fiend Pact Warlock and I did a Genie Warlock and I did the brainstorming trying to come up with some new interactions and I didn't really come up with any. So the builds you get are basically, here is a good Genie Warlock, here is a good Fiend Warlock, here's the feats you probably want to take, here's the spells you probably want to take. But if you're aware of how to make a good Warlock, then you probably, if you watch those videos, you didn't get anything new from them. Then again, if you aren't aware of how to make a good Warlock, they did present that information. Then there's other times where I come up with multiple ideas at the same time, and I can give you an example of that. Uh, so I did a video called the Terran Scare, the Terran Scare build. This video actually did not perform that well, but it presents two new ideas, or at least new at the time. This video is over a year old, and I've seen at least one of these interactions several times since then. But Fisbin's Treasury of Dragons had just come out. There were new Dragonborn, and the Dragonborn had a breath weapon that replaced an attack rather than using an action. And I thought, that's interesting. And I thought, actually, I didn't do the research. I just remembered, wasn't there a feat that Dragonborn could take where they could use their breath weapon for something else? And then I looked, and I saw the Dragon Fear feat, which is a feat that I had basically disregarded. Because, I mean, it's an okay feat, but it's okay. But then I thought, with these new Dragonborn, if you use this feat, we're now just replacing an attack rather than actually using our entire action. That makes this a lot better. There's something here. And I thought, okay, so what am I going to do if I've got extra attack? I'm going to use Dragon Fear in place of one attack. What am I going to do with the other attack? And then that's when I thought of the Blade Singer because the Blade Singer has a special extra attack where they can make one weapon attack and they can cast a cantrip. And I thought, well, that's cool because now I can do Dragon Fear and then do a cantrip and then I'm not making a weapon attack at all. I thought, what can I do with that cantrip? What should I do with it? And of course, you're looking at wizard cantrips first because you're concentrating on intelligence and they're all okay, but I thought... What about Eldritch Blast? Is there a way I could do Eldritch Blast and Dragon Fear in the same round? So then I'm getting multiple attacks with Eldritch Blast and doing Dragon Fear, and it's just taking one action. That's really cool if I can work that out. Issue is, of course, that if you're taking six levels of Blade Singer, you usually want to have a pretty good intelligence because, I mean, Blade Song relies heavily on intelligence. But if we're relying on intelligence, is there any way I can get Eldritch Blast based on intelligence and get Agonizing Blast and get Repelling Blast? And I couldn't come up with anything. I'm like, no, nope, you would have to concentrate on Charisma. If I concentrate on Charisma, then I'm taking six levels of Bladesinger, probably with a 13 intelligence. That's pretty rough. But once I've got it, that would be pretty cool because then I'm doing Eldritch Blast with Repelling Blast and Agonizing Blast and Dragon Fear. I'm not making any weapon attacks at all. That would be great. And so there's basically two ideas that were new at the time that I included in that. Now I've seen Eldritch Blast used with Bladesinger many times since then, but up to that point I had not seen it at all. So that's kind of the process I use. Let's jump to the present. So I've just completed my Moon Druid video series and I've decided to look at the Swarmkeeper Ranger. Now, can I say right now how much I hate the Gloomstalker Ranger? One major weakness in 5th edition is that sometimes they create an option that's so good, it basically invalidates the other options, at least in a practical sense. So instead of giving us more choices, they're actually removing choices. Gloomstalker is a prime example of this. It's so much better than all the other Ranger subclasses, it takes the shine off of them. So when Tashas came out, they gave us two new Ranger subclasses, and I really like both of them. But I've held off on really diving into the Swarm Keeper because ultimately I know that anything I come up with is still not going to match the Gloomstalker in power. And that sucks. When the new player's handbook comes out, whether it's backwards compatible or not, 
I can tell you that, as far as I'm concerned, goodbye Gloomstalker. I think what I'll probably do is I'll just phase out Xanathar's Guide to Everything entirely. But I've decided I'm going to look at the Swarm Keeper, specifically the Gathered Swarm feature that you get at level 3. The first thing I did is I asked on Twitter what players had can prize their swarms out of because there's a lot of creativity involved, and I got a lot of responses. Here's a few of them. Flying mice with axes, mechanical lizards, lovebirds, crows, wasps. I hate wasps, by the way. I'm allergic, so I wasn't even going to go there. Bats, chickens, ravens, a black mist, fleas, cats, smoke, bees, owls, butterflies, forest spirits, bunnies, locusts, leaves, ants, squirrels, centipedes, tiny versions of their own character. That gives me kind of an army of darkness vibe. Fireflies, little kobolds, puppies, crabs, flies, twig blights, mosquitoes, beetles, pixies, nuts and bolts on a warforge. That was a cool idea. And the list goes on. But if you're brainstorming ideas, that might get you started. The suggestion that kind of spoke to me was sand, because I thought of Sandman from Spider-Man. And I thought, yeah, that would be kind of cool, that you're manipulating the sand like Sandman would to do these special things. Here is what Gathered Swarm does. Once on each of your turns, you can choose one of three options after you hit a creature with an attack. Either you can have the target take a d6 piercing damage from the swarm, or you can have the target make a strength saving throw against your spell DC, or be moved 15 feet in a horizontal direction of your choice, or you can move yourself 5 feet horizontally in the direction of your choice. This is without question the defining feature of this subclass. There's some other notable stuff, like at level 5 you get the web spell, and it's a ranger spell for us. Getting the web spell with a wisdom based DC isn't easy. Maybe you can do it with one of the backgrounds that gives you additional spell selections, like the Ravnica backgrounds or the Strixhaven backgrounds. But I can't think of any non-setting specific stuff other than Swarmkeeper Ranger that can do it. And then at 7th level you get a bonus action, multiple use, 1 minute, concentration free, fly speed. Which would be fantastic if it weren't for that very, very slow 10 foot speed. Still, there are ways to increase your speed. Level 11 gives your Gathered Swarm some boosts that are okay. The damage boost is sad. A D6 becomes a D8 after 8 levels of progression. Rune Knight does a similar thing with Giant Smite. And in my opinion, this scaling is just way too small. It's going to be 1 point of damage on average difference. As far as I'm concerned, these kinds of features should probably just scale an entire die, like become 2D6. But a D8 is what we get. Or you can knock a creature prone after moving it. And that might be good, but it really depends. Prone is one of those conditions... It's not always great to throw on your enemies because attacks against them that aren't within 5 feet now have disadvantage and you push them away. So it depends. Sure, the rest of your attacks might have advantage if you move that 15 feet up to them and you have attacks left. Maybe the decreased movement from having to get up from prone is going to make a difference. So it might be okay, but it depends. And then you can get half cover if you're moved by your swarm until the start of your next turn. So that's a plus 2 AC, assuming you can't get cover without it. And these are okay boosts, but when I'm considering a build and then I have to suddenly look at investing 11 levels into Swarmkeeper to get these boosts, I'm just not sure it's worth that kind of investment. Then the 15th level feature is also decent. You get a reaction when you take damage that gives you resistance and a short range teleport proficiency bonus times per long rest. Not bad, but it's not so great I'm shooting for level 15. So when I'm looking at jump points, I'm immediately thinking maybe level 5. That gives you Gathered Swarm and extra attack. Or maybe level 7 if I want flight. But in that case, then I need to look at building up the movement speed in flight. And if I'm going to go 7 levels, then I might as well go 8 levels to get the feat. The Long Strider spell is obvious and it's going to be easy to get. But then I'm looking at things like the mobile feat that would also increase our speed. And as someone with a lot of experience making builds, I don't need to do the build to know I'm not going to have enough feats. Especially, I'm never going to have room for quality of life feats. So, now I start thinking about races. Are there any races that could boost fly speed? I mean, there's multiple races that can improve your walking speed, but it's not going to translate to flight. But I double check to make sure, and yeah, no, it's not. Something like Phase Step could work in tandem with flight speed, so that's a possibility. Orcs can dash as a bonus action a limited number of times. Tabaxi can double their speed on their turn but they can't do it again until they move zero on a following turn. But the thing about Orc and Tabaxi is you're getting double your speed effectively 
but the speed is really slow. So double a small number doesn't end up being a big number. But there is some stuff, but there's just nothing that terrific or sustainable. So I kind of think a fly speed of 20 is probably the best I can get for any sustained amount of time. It's still better than not being able to fly though, so I still might want 8 levels. Let's go back to Gathered Swarm. This is the feature I want to build around. Other classes can get flight, nobody else gets this. If I want a flight build, Genie Warlock is better. And this happens all the time to me. So I look at this flight speed and I go, there are ways to increase this speed. I'm going to find them and then I can work them into my build. And then you do the research and you determine nothing is really working great here. I'll use the Long Strider spell, of course, but nothing else is really worth the investment. And so I abandoned the idea of coming up with a good flight speed for the Swarmkeeper Ranger. And again, this happens all the time. Sometimes you just have to give up. But optimizing a Swarmkeeper, it has to be something with this feature. This is where it's got to be. The D6 damage is not unique. Once per turn, damage bonuses are actually quite common. Though a lot of them are limited by target or number of uses. This is obviously going to be a backup though. Nothing great to do with the movement options, then we'll take the D6. The third bullet point is also clearly not something we're going to build around. It's going to be a way to escape a grapple, or a web spell, or avoid an attack of opportunity, but it's not something we're going to specifically set up to use. So if we are going to optimize this feature, we have to find a way to optimize the middle point, the 15 feet of movement. This one is unique in two ways. First, Usually force movement as part of an attack is going to be 5 feet, like the Crusher feet, or 10 feet with Repelling Blast or Grasp of Adar. So 15 feet is unusual. Also, often movement that's forced is either towards or away from your character, so the option here to force movement sideways is not unique, but it is unusual. The feature provides a strength saving throw to avoid the movement, but on the other hand, there at least is no size restriction. So here is where it comes down to, am I going to end up presenting a build that is a vanilla Swarmkeeper Ranger? In other words, I'm going to try to move creatures, I'll probably try to move them through Spike Growth Spell, or move them into my web spell, and that's the build. And, you know, that could be the build I end up presenting if I don't come up with anything else. Or am I going to find a special way to use this feature that interacts nicely with another mechanic, that maybe nobody has thought of before or talked about before. So that's when I open all my D&D Beyond tabs and I start going through the classes, races, feats, and spells. Sometimes this process takes a long time and often it is not productive. However, this time it didn't take me very long. I mean, it's pretty obvious if you think about it. 15 feet is exactly the right distance for a go-to spell, Spirit Guardians. Now, Rangers don't get Spirit Guardians, but Ranger and Cleric multiclass pretty well. So with Spirit Guardians, they flit 15 feet around you in every direction. You can be creative in describing your Spirit Guardians. And so I come to the obvious conclusion that it will be Swirling Sand, right? So I've got Swirling Sand from Spirit Guardians, and then I've got Manipulated Sand through my Gathered Swarm. The Sandman concept is coming together. A creature that enters the area or starts its turn in the area takes the damage. This is a really standard tactic, and I've even made a video about this. What you want to do is manipulate creatures so they get pulled into the area by force movement. So they take the damage when they enter, and then again at the start of their turn. So twice the damage. So if I was to do a ranged build, what I could do is move so that a creature is just outside the area, then shoot them with an arrow or whatever, and then try to use my Gathered Swarm to push them in. Of course, if I do that, then... I'm not really taking advantage of the unique properties of Gathered Swarm because I could do the same thing with the telekinetic feat or I could throw a hammer and use the crusher feat. Uh, so I don't need Gathered Swarm to do that. What's cool about Gathered Swarm with the 15 feet is I could push them out of the Spirit Guardians, but then I need a way to pull them back in. And then I think of another thing, and you maybe have already thought of this yourself, but this is when it came to me is why don't I just back away? Like if I just back away 15 feet from an enemy that's next to me, and then I can just pull them back in, then I don't really need Gathered Swarm. 
I could just play any class, take telekinetic or throw a hammer and use the crusher feet, and I'm pulling him back in and Swarm Keeper kind of becomes useless. But then I think, you know, there are times when you're next to a creature, if you back away, they'll get an opportunity attack. You probably don't want that, especially since it would potentially mean a concentration save for your Spirit Guardians. Also, what if they're grappling you? Well, then there's no way to back away. And what if you just can't back up? What if there's a wall there? What if there's other creatures there that are enemies so you can't move through them? There are definitely lots of cases where this tactic doesn't work, and I know it because I've seen it happen. The, the tactic with Spirit Guardians is really old. It's been around a long time, and I've seen it played many, many times, and it often works great, and it often doesn't work because there are issues that Gathered Swarm could solve for me. So if I am next to a creature, and I don't want to provoke an attack of opportunity, but I still want to get my full attacks against them, Gathered Swarm solves that issue. Because now I can make my full attacks, then I can use Gathered Swarm and push them completely out of the Spirit Guardians. I don't have to worry about opportunity attacks. If they were grappling me, it's broken. If there is a wall behind me, I didn't need to back up. If there's enemies behind me, I didn't need to back up. It solves all of that. The issue is, once I push them out, they're not taking any additional damage unless they're pulled back in. Now, just how, in the name of Sandy McSanderson, am I going to accomplish that? The most obvious answer is the telekinetic feat. So we push it out with Gathered Swarm, then we use our bonus action and pull it back in. There's two things I don't like about that that make it so I just would never put that on a build. The first is... For it to work, a creature needs to fail two saving throws, one against the Gathered Swarm and one against the Telekinetic. And if it makes either saving throw, you don't deliver the damage. That's no good. And the second issue is, if I'm making melee attacks, I probably want to be using a bonus action attack with Polar Master or something. And then I would have to give that up because Telekinetic requires a bonus action. So I'm just really not a fan of this interaction. And I'm thinking, if that's all I can come up with, Spirit Guardians isn't doing anything special for us here. And things are kind of spiraling downwards, and I'm starting to think that this isn't going to work. Because now I think of another problem. I was just thinking about saving throws and why I don't want them to be making two saving throws. But then it occurs to me that Gathered Swarm is still giving a saving throw, and that's based on my Wisdom, because it's my spell DC. But I'm not making my attacks with Wisdom. If I'm using Polar Master, I'm probably using a Spear or a Quarterstaff. Uh, and then I'm probably using my Strength. And am I going to concentrate on Strength or am I going to concentrate on Wisdom? And it's even if I get it to be Dexterity, like I could take a level in Monk and then use Martial Arts and then you can attack with a Quarterstaff using your Dexterity. It's still the same problem. Am I concentrating on Dexterity or Wisdom? Because if I concentrate on Wisdom and start raising my Wisdom, then my chance to hit suffers and my damage suffers. And if my chance to hit suffers, actually, there's less chance I can use Gathered Swarm in the first place because I have to hit with at least one attack to use it. And if I miss because I've been concentrating on Wisdom, that's no good. Though I do come up with a solution for that fairly quickly, and that's the Shillelagh Cantrip, because then I could use a Quarterstaff and if I can cast Shillelagh, then I can use Wisdom for my attacks, my damage, and my spell DC for Gathered Swarm. So I'm going to need the Shillelagh Cantrip on this build. So I'm going to have to think about how I'm going to get that enemy back into the Spirit Guardians eventually. But first, let's figure out how we're going to get Shillelagh. There's a lot of ways we can do it. I mean, there's the Druidic Warrior fighting style. Rangers can get it, and then they get Druid Cantrips. So they could just take Shillelagh. But you know what? If I'm using a quarterstaff or a spear in combat, I really want the dueling fighting style for that plus two damage because the base damage isn't that great and a plus two actually makes quite a difference. And that kind of hurts to give up. Now, there's just no way. I, I disregard right away the idea of taking a feat to get the cantrip. Not going to have enough feats. I already know it. I don't need to make the build to know I'm not going to have enough feats. I just can't be taking more feats. So there are two other solutions. I can dip through it. That's the obvious one, right? You dip Druid, you take the cantrip. The other is Nature Cleric. If I take Nature Cleric, and I'm already wanting Spirit Guardians, so I know I'm going to be going Cleric for five levels to get Spirit Guardians. 
if I chose the nature domain, then I can get the shillelagh cantrip. So that seems to be the obvious solution to me. Though I do want to at least consider the other subclasses for cleric and make sure I'm not giving up anything that one of those other subclasses would get by level five that would be tragic for this build. Because if that's the case, then maybe I want one dip in druid and then go with that other subclass of cleric. So for my builds, I generally put a ban on peace and twilight subclasses. I mentioned hating the gloom stalker subclass, but I really hate peace and twilight subclasses for the exact same reason. Screw those subclasses. So I'm looking at other options. Going through them, there's some okay stuff, but nothing I figure is necessary for the build, so Nature Cleric should work fine. So I've got a Wisdom-based melee attack, Spirit Guardians, I'm using Gathered Swarm to push them out of the spell effect, but can I get them back in? I'm back at the same problem. Can I get them back in after I've pushed them out? Because if I can't, this whole concept is gone and I'm back to regular Swarmkeeper Ranger and push creatures over my spike growth. I think of the Crusher feat, which imposes 5 feet of movement in any direction when you hit a creature with an attack. So ideally, we would use our Shillelagh to hit the creature, push them out of the Spirit Guardians with Gathered Swarm, then pull them back in with the Crusher feat on the same attack. Maybe. Because here's where Order of Operations is really important. The Crusher feat says you move a creature when you hit a creature with an attack that deals bludgeoning damage. Shillelagh delivers bludgeoning, so that's okay. The question is whether the wording of Gathered Swarm would suggest that it occurs after this, because for this to work, Gathered Swarm has to be first. Push them 15 feet, then pull them 5 feet. So going back to Gathered Swarm, I look at the wording immediately after you hit a creature with an attack, compared to when you hit a creature with an attack that delivers bludgeoning damage. The words that are concerning me here are when and after. I think this could be read as Crusher happening as part of the attack, while Gathered Swarm occurs after the attack. On the other hand, the five feet of movement clearly happens after the bludgeoning damage is delivered, but I'm just not sure about that. So I try to think of other ways we pull that creature back into the Spirit Guardians that doesn't require us to move closer, because if we do, then the Spirit Guardians isn't going to work, and doesn't provide another saving throw. And I come up with nothing. I mean, I come up with nothing practical, because you could take six levels in Bladesinger, then you could make your attack, push with Gathered Swarm, then you cast an Eldritch Blast with Grasp of Vidar to pull them back in. So we just need six levels in Wizard, and a couple in Warlock, and a Charisma-based attack roll with Eldritch Blast. I mean, it's obviously a non-starter. I could think of nothing practical. Now, if we were a bugbear with a Reach weapon, we could almost do another attack and get them back in, but it just doesn't quite reach. Now, we could take three levels of Battlemaster for lunging attack, and that would do it, but that's a super limited resource, and we're talking about a three-level class investment. It's a no-go. Now, the reason I'm talking about a bunch of things that don't work here is because the purpose of this video is to tell you how I optimize builds, and when I optimize builds, what you see in the final product is what I settled on, not what I abandoned. And there's a lot of stuff in almost every build I present that I abandoned because ultimately I determined it either doesn't work or it's too big an investment, I can't fit it on the build, and so you never hear about it, but that time I invested researching it was there. So for this build, one of my primary issues is that I'm uncertain about the order of operations for Gathered Swarm and Crusher, and I wanted to find a solution that you wouldn't have to ask your DM about. And I figured it would be easy enough to use a reach weapon and get bludgeoning damage, because if we're using Polar Master anyways, if I wasn't going to use a quarterstaff or a spear or something like that, of course this would mean abandoning Shillelagh, which I hadn't even considered yet, but if I used a Halberd or if I used a Glaive, then when I make my bonus action attack, that attack delivers bludgeoning damage. So I could make my attacks, shoot the creature out of the Spirit Guardians with Gathered Swarm. If I could somehow reach that creature with that bonus action attack, I could use Crusher and pull them back in. And that's when I started thinking, well, I could get an additional five feet of reach with the Bugbear. That just doesn't quite get me there. 
And I'm in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I know there's got to be another way to add reach to a weapon. And I didn't remember what it was. So it required research. And when I came up with the lunging maneuver for Battlemaster, that wasn't off the top of my head because the lunging maneuver, that's a maneuver I never take. I forget it even exists because if I'm going to make a Battlemaster, I never take lunging attack. So it required finding that. And that took time. And then ultimately, I have this solution that just doesn't quite fit on the build. So I'm going to have to abandon it. So it's a failure. And that's what I'm trying to get across is that when you see these optimized builds, it's usually a whole bunch of failure that you don't hear about. And we're just going to tell you about the successes. So I am brainstorming for solutions. And then I wonder, what about Gathered Swarm? Like, what if I push them five feet with Crusher first? And then I use Gathered Swarm and I push them an additional 10 feet and then pull them back 5 feet with the last 5 feet of movement from Gathered Swarm. So I go back to the Gathered Swarm feature and read exactly how it's worded. And it says, you move them 15 feet in a direction of your choice, as in a single direction, that's not going to work. And so basically after trying to problem solve this and just not succeeding, what I decide is, you know, I'm not sure whether you can use Crusher after Gathered Swarm or not. I'm just not sure. Uh, the wording is vague enough that I don't think there's a definitive answer. So what I'm going to have to do with the build is put in that disclaimer that you often hear in my builds where you should probably have a conversation with your DM and make sure you're on the same page as to how this works. And if you're not, then this build isn't going to work. And ultimately, that's where this one's going to have to end up. Okay, so clerics don't get the fly spell. So now I'm thinking this build will go with eight levels of ranger to get that flight speed. Also, flying with spirit guardians can work well. I mean, we can fly 20 feet above our enemy, then we could, you know, throw a hammer at them and pull them up with crusher and they would take the damage. So eight levels of ranger, I'm gonna need five levels of cleric. So that's a 13th level build. Though I figure we can get this combo really going after five ranger and five cleric. But at 13th level, we're talking about three ability score increases. So what feats do I need? Well, if I want to use Spirit Guardians, then I definitely want to protect Concentration. So probably Warcaster and Resilient Constitution. And I'm going to need Polar Master as well. Now I'm going to have three feats, so that's okay. Except then I'm thinking, what's the point on focusing on Wisdom if I don't raise my Wisdom? Because... I mean, I'll start with a plus three bonus to wisdom, but I could start with a plus three bonus to strength as well. So why do I need the shillelagh spell at all if I'm only going to take feats that don't raise those ability scores? It, it's pointless. I have to at least raise my wisdom up to an 18 or this was all for nothing. So I'm not going to have three feat selections. I just can't fit it. So maybe I dip... Fighter at level 1 for Constitution Saving Throw Proficiency. That would save me a feat. In fact, if I dip Fighter, what I could do is take Resilient Wisdom instead of Resilient Constitution, and that would bring a starting 17 Wisdom up to 18. But then I think, what about Sorcerer instead? Because Fighter 1 really doesn't give us very much, and I'm not really interested in doing a lot of Fighter because it's not increasing our spell slot progression, and with Spirit Guardians, you really need your spell slot progression because you want to upcast it. I mean, a one level dip isn't the end of the world, but if I could fit Sorcerer, then I could get that Constitution saving throw proficiency and I don't give up any spell slot progression. The issue is then I need a 13 Charisma on this character that's supposed to be focusing on Wisdom. And I don't see how I'd do that. Or could I? If I get Shillelagh, then I don't need a huge strength score. In fact, I could dump strength because we're not going to need strength for any of my multiclassing. All I really need is a super high wisdom and then just enough to multiclass out of Ranger, which is going to require a 13 dexterity, and into Cleric, and I already have the wisdom, and into Sorcerer, and so I'll need a 13 Charisma. Now, another option is Nature Cleric gives us heavy armor proficiency, so I could go with strength and dump dexterity, but I can't because I need a 13 dexterity to multi-class ranger. So yeah, I guess we just have to stick with medium armor. So I've got a 27 point buy and I want to consider the absolute minimum number I want for each score. 
Probably I'm looking at a plus two plus one for racial modifiers or just a plus two if I go with custom lineage. And that would give me an extra feat. Thematically though, with a sand controlling theme, I really like the idea of Earth Genasi. So what do we got? We got strength, we can dump, zero points. Dexterity, I want 14. So that's seven points and I'm down to 20. Constitution, 14 is an absolute minimum. I, I mean, I'd like 16, but I could get away with 14. So I'm down to 13 points. Intelligence, I can dump. So zero points. Now wisdom, I need the maximum. I need to focus on my wisdom. That's nine points and I'm down to four. So I've got four points and that only gets me up to a 12 charisma. But if I have another racial plus one, then that's 13. That's what I need. Now, I could also work it with custom lineage if the bonus feat was a half feat that improved my dexterity or constitution or wisdom or charisma. Now, I consider resilient wisdom. This would mean I could still get a 17 wisdom with 7 points, giving me 2 more points to get charisma 13. The problem, though, is none of the other must-have feats are half feats. I need resilient wisdom, I need warcaster, and I need polar master. I figure, you know what, I'll think about race later. What I have determined is that the Sorcerer Dip is possible. A Sorcerer Dip also means the Shield Spell, so that's awesome. So now I have one Sorcerer, five Cleric, five Ranger, and then three more Ranger. So that would be Polar Master or Resilient Wisdom at level 5, and then the other at level 10, then Warcaster at 14. And 14 strikes me as really late to get Warcaster. So do I need Warcaster at all then? 14 constitution is plus 2, proficiency is plus 2, but eventually plus 6. Then if we take the Divine Soul Sorcerer, we have an emergency 2d4 once per short rest. You know, that's not too bad. Maybe at level 14, we raise our wisdom up to 20. Now I think about the progression. So the Sorcerer Dip has to be level 1. So I'd take the Sleep Spell, and I would be okay for that level. And then I'd get the Shield Spell, and that would be good for all levels. So do I go Cleric or Ranger next? I mean, it's got to be Cleric for at least one level to get Shillelagh. Now, I could dip that and then go 5 Ranger, but that's two class dips on a character that desperately needs extra attack. Cleric is just cleaner. I can use Bless, Toll the Dead, Spiritual Weapon, Spirit Guardians. Then I go Ranger. So I get Resilient Wisdom first, which means Polar Master at 10 and extra attack at 11. So I go from being kind of a standard Cleric to a melee character at 11th level. And now I just realize I forgot the Crusher feat. Whoopsie. Oh yeah. And damn it. And I panic for about five minutes. Then it comes to me that if I was to use Custom Lineage and take Crusher at level 1, I could improve my constitution from 13 to 14 with that, and then I would have those two points I need to get the Charisma of 13. Earth Genasi, it's just going to have to wait for another build. I have to go Custom Lineage and now it's back to working. I've got the feats I need. And now the bones of the build are done. I know exactly what my ability scores are going to be, what race I need to be, which feats I need, and when I'll get them, when my wisdom modifier will improve, and the rest of my spell selection is simply going to be an exercise in picking the you know best options for each level. So at this point, I have got an interaction I think is unique. I have got the basics bones of the build. I know what the levels are going to be, what feats are going to be taken, what the ability scores are going to be, what the race is going to be. I have enough data now to get to the scary part, and that's proof of concept. Because if this doesn't work, and it ends up being a failed build, then I either don't do a video at all, or I can do a failed build video. I've done that before. What I won't do is present a build as optimized when it's not. If it doesn't work, I'm not going to put lipstick on a pig. I'll just either make a video and say, yeah, I tried this out. It's not good enough. And this is what happened. But I probably wouldn't for this one because I've done this video. Uh, and then the other possibility is it does enough damage. And then I can actually present it as an optimized build with an interesting interaction. And I think that's what I have here because I have done the math and it's enough. It's not fantastic. I'm not going to present the math in this video because I do that in my build video, which will be my next video. Though I should probably mention that I changed one of the decisions I had made on this build. I had 
determined I needed the Polar Master Feat, and I found that I can actually do more damage without it. So I was able to get rid of another feat on this build. And the damage worked out for single target damage to 41% over baseline. And 41% over baseline isn't bad, but it's not huge. But I figured there's enough other stuff going on here. I've got a Spirit Guardians, and it might be only doing damage to one target, but it might be doing damage to other targets as well. And I didn't add anything to my DPR for that because multiple target damage is a total other beast. And then I'm doing force movement. That might be complementing other things that other characters are doing. It might be pushing somebody off a cliff or other kind of beneficial movements. So there's that as well. Then I figured I'm going to have two fourth level slots. I'll be using those for Spirit Guardians. And I will have a whole bunch of second and third level slots that aren't accounted for. And I haven't even chosen what spells those will be yet. But I'll have second and third level spells. So I'll have good spells to cast with those slots. That's another way I'm going to be able to contribute. So I think there's enough here that I can say this is an optimized build and present it. So that is what I'm going to be doing in my next video. And that is how I optimize a build. A lot of failures and a few successes and I just grasp onto the successes I have, put it together and hope it's good enough. And if it's not, then I either abandon it entirely or I'm gonna make a video about it anyways. And I've done that. If you look in my channel, you're gonna find there's a video on a monk in heavy armor. And I say in that video, I had this neat idea and I worked on it and it just didn't work out. Then I have another one with a monk using a longbow and same thing. I say, you know, I tried, it just doesn't work out. And at least I've got a video, though I tend not to be particularly proud of my failures but that's some of my build videos. And then other ones are just those vanilla builds where this is a swarm keeper. Here's how I would make it. I would take spike growth. I would take web. I would use gathered swarm and try to push them through those effects. And my build video for swarm keeper could have been one of those videos. It would have been very easy to do that, especially if this idea didn't work out. And then you have my build videos where I come up with something new that works. And then I present it as an optimized build. And those are my favorites because I've come up with a new idea on my own that works and that's fulfilling to me. But that is basically how I do optimization, how I come up with optimization builds, the process I use. And I'm curious if you do optimization builds of your own, do you use the same process I do or do you do something differently? Let's discuss it in the comments. Because here's the thing, if you've got a good way to do it that I haven't used, I love to know what it is because let's get better at this. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.